Uh, thanks for joining us today for the uh, final lecture in the Vermont um, Behavior and Health Lecture Series uh, the spring semester. We will pick up again um, September 20th. So uh, keep an eye out for us. And um, But uh, thanks for being here today. We're really um, in for a treat. We have Tara Fazzino, um, who is the Associate Professor of Psychology in the Depar Department of Psychology at the University of Kansas, my graduate school alma mater, go Jayhawks. Um, Kara is, as you can see, she's gonna um, talk to us about crossing fields to make scientific connections, reinforcement processes in addiction, binge eating and obesity. Um, Tara did her graduate training at the University of Vermont where she got her PhD in experimental psychology. I would love to claim credit that she trained with us, but that's not true. She trained with Gail Rose and John Helzer and did research, as you'll see, that is related to what she still does today, uh, brief interventions for alcohol. During her graduate training, it was mostly um, brief interventions in um, uh, primary care settings, but she was also then uh, she was interested and went on to postdoctoral training at the um, KU Med Center where she was in the Department of uh, Venom Medicine and Public Health. And uh, while there she got a competitive um, F32 uh, postdoctoral award from NIAAA where she was um, studying the effects of heavy alcohol use on weight gain in college students. And um, from there, she stayed on and, and, and got the faculty position I already mentioned, um, where she is associate director of the Coffrin Logan Center for Addiction Research and Treatment. And there's a connection there um, back to the University of Vermont as well. Um, as Richard Yi, um, a graduate of our uh, postdoctoral program, is, is the director. So she and, um, and Richard are doing terrific work in that center. Um, Tara, I, I was so impressed to see, has already established herself as an independent investigator, getting a, an R01 from NIAAA um, to lead a large cluster randomized trial of brief interventions. Um, with college students during their uh, orientation course. And uh, that's really an important topic as we all know, um, heavy drinking uh, during the college years is common and uh, too many times uh, results in catastrophic outcomes. So uh, Tara is just a wonderful uh, early career investigator, but well, no longer she's an independent investigator. Sorry, Tara. Um, I, when she was at, at K at UVM, she had her office right down the hall from mine. So there was many an evening where I, I would bump into Tara in the hallway and we would chat about science. And, and she's really a wonderful um, independent thinker and very smart. And so Tara, thanks for taking the time with, uh, to be with us today. And uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Steve, for that introduction. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm so happy to at least be back with you all virtually. I actually have not um, been back to UVM since I graduated. So this is um, great to at least be here with you in this capacity and to basically give you an update on what I've been up to since I graduated. <clears throat> Um, as Steve mentioned, I have had the opportunity to work in multiple fields during my graduate and um, postdoctoral training. Um, it, as, a, oops, as a graduate student, um, I worked primarily in alcohol use from a prevention standpoint um, with, um, as, as Steve mentioned, um, Gail Rose and John Helzer. Um, and we also sort of, um, for my dissertation, worked in, in the college um, drinking um, sort of prevention scene. So um, I, I started out there and then I was also able to get um, experience in um, obesity treatment research. And being able to work in both of these fields provided me the opportunity to be able to kind of zoom out a bit and see patterns in 
um, scientific inquiry in behaviors across fields. And um, also I think to potentially be able to identify some um, points that maybe um, were sort of overlooked across fields. Um, so this just gave me a really useful and a very um, helpful perspective. Um, and so I'll tell you about two things today that um, really caught my eye as, during my time um, as a trainee and um, that really influenced the program of research that I've developed today. The first um, observation that I made was that there were some interesting effects um, on health that kind of went in both directions. Um, for example, um, you, in one study and using a national sample of um, adolescents transitioning to adulthood, um, I found that, adoles that um, young adults um, who were engaged in a pattern of regular um, risky drinking um, were at up to 40% greater likelihood of transitioning from um, an overweight to obese uh, body mass index um, and um, or a healthy uh, weight to overweight um, in later adulthood um, as a result of this of this pattern. So this this illustrated to me that that um, sort of risk behavior in one area could have implications for another um, area um, of health as well. I also noticed that the um, some of the effects could also go the other way. In um, in a in some work um, in a weight management intervention for breast cancer survivors. Um, I observed that although the, um, the participants were going through a standard weight loss and weight management um, intervention, they actually exhibited some um, decreases in their alcohol use. Um, this alcohol use was primarily lower risk to begin with. However, the decreases were notable given that um, alcohol use um, particularly among breast cancer survivors can increase the um, risk for recurrence. So being able to even shift their drinking a little bit could be useful um, for their health. Um, and what was also interesting to me was that <clears throat> despite, um, was that because they were going through a standard intervention, alcohol use was not really a main focus. It was very briefly mentioned. So this illustrated to me the point that sometimes um, um, the effects from one intervention um, can have indirect effects on other behaviors um, that are also important for health. The second area that really caught my attention was in um, some reinforcement processes that I noticed that were also common um, across fields. And um, when looking at particularly the college drinking setting, we know that college students often drink um, they, to feel the effects of the alcohol. Um, it's fun, it's a, you know, a, positive reinforcing experience in that regard. Um, some of my work um, also found that individuals may engage with highly palatable foods in a similar manner to um, consume them to experience their rewarding effects. And so this was a, a very interesting um, um, point of commonality across these areas as well. So in making these connections, my attention shifted to thinking about the food specifically um, and considering given that that people may engage with this food to some degree in a similar manner as they engage in other with other um, substances, um, it made me question, well, what's in the food? Um, what specifically about it makes people engage with it in this way? And this is what has led me to forming my, um, my research program uh, that I will tell you about today um, that really has used a framework of focusing on reinforcement processes and health. Um, one area of focus is um, primarily in the prevention area um, on um, risky drinking and related behaviors, including binge eating with the target being um, highly palatable foods um, and attempting to address um, some uh, reinforcement processes uh, to prevent these be uh, behaviors. And another area of my work has been much more sort of basic and foundational um, in terms of actually trying to identify what specifically about highly palatable foods um, yields their um, strong reinforcing properties and may have um, some people engage in them in a way um, that may uh, be considered an addictive behavior. 
My first area of work um, I'll tell you about first is in the prevention area. My area of research um, is primarily focused on two reward-seeking behaviors that directly involve caloric consumption. Um, so risky alcohol consumption and binge eating with the target of uh, highly palatable foods. I should mention that I, in my work, consider these behaviors, particularly in the young adult population that I typically work with, um, highly normative. It, alcohol use is extremely common among young adults and so is consuming highly palatable foods, which are widely available in our environment. And um, so I, I conceptualize these behaviors as relatively normative to some degree. Um, however, also, of course, um, existing on a dimension where um, some may engage in kind of low level use that may not present a risk um, to people's health overall. Um, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, individuals may um, experience clinically um, substantial consequences related to, for example, alcohol use disorder, binge eating disorder, and also possibly obesity. And my question has been, has, is there a way to address sources of reinforcement um, such that um, we might be able to prevent um, or shift some of the focus on um, engaging in um, risky drinking and binge eating for the rewarding effects um, to alternative and maybe healthier sources. I've employed a, um, an approach called a brief behavioral activation by, uh, created by Ledgeway and Hopko um, some time ago. And the premise of this intervention is really focused on um, the fact that we all need some level of um, sources of environmental reinforcement. Um, from our environment to kind of exist and, and move through our day in a healthy manner. And a lack of um, access to or engagement in sources of reinforcement in our environment um, may lead to um, either depression, which is what, um, or depressive symptoms, um, which is what um, the brief behavioral activation was originally designed for. Um, however, this, this same deficit can also um, yield reliance on substances as a primary source of reinforcement. And, so, and recently, behavioral activation has been applied, particularly in the last like five to 10 years, um, to various areas of substance use um, with some initial strong evidence of efficacy. And so my interest has been potentially applying this in a college setting where I think we've had we've had some progress, but it's been really modest in terms of um, shifting the drinking um, levels of risky drinking and kind of the drinking culture. And I think it's largely been because oftentimes college students drink because it's fun. And our approach is to attempting to decrease risky drinking among college students um, have primarily focused on identifying ways or, or finding ways to tell students that they shouldn't do it, um, loosely speaking. But, but it doesn't really get at the premise that like, they're mostly doing it because it's fun and they don't want to stop because it's fun. So <laughs> my interest in, in applying this in a, in a college setting and potentially with a, a prevention lens is, can we do something about this? Can we actually address the the, uh, you know, their um, sources of environmental reinforcement and attempt to potentially shift um, folks away from relying on risky drinking as a primary source of reinforcement, um, particularly as they enter college. And so we um, um, were, I was awarded a five year um, um, R01 um, from the National Institutes of Health um, with my co-investigators, Dr. Richard Yee and uh, Dr. Carl Lejway. And in this, we are using um, behavioral activation and overlaying it um, within an existing university infrastructure um, as the University 101 freshman seminar. The University 101 seminar at KU um, it's pretty standard. It's, it's employed in many universities nationwide. And um, freshmen sign up for it when they enter college and it's an, it runs the entire um, fall semester. Um, so in this, we have a somewhat captive audience. Um, and so we'll be running 36 course sections. Um, we'll, we're cluster randomizing these course sections to either the behavioral activation or the control uh, to standard orientation um, course sections. And um, our 
so students sign up for the courses via the university registrar and what they can send to is participation in the assessment part of the intervention that we introduce um, at the beginning of the semester and for the um and so we conduct assessments um at the beginning middle and end of the semester and then at two follow-up points um at the end of their freshman year and sophomore year our main outcome is focused on risky drinking. Um, however, we have um, identified a priori secondary outcomes, which includes uh, binge eating, um, symptoms of depression, and also stress. Um, our primary mechanism um, of action that we are hypothesizing is um, a change in sources of environmental reinforcement. Um, it, it consists with the uh, principles of uh, behavioral activation. And we also have hypothesized um, a potential change in delayed discounting during the course of the intervention as another uh, potential mechanism. As I think many researchers are making statements um, like this, uh, within the past couple of years. Um, we, I will be presenting you limited information today um, because COVID has delayed us pretty substantially. <laughs> so we actually had to hold this entire trial for a year um, because the circumstances that we were trying to study um, and the anticipated behaviors that we were gonna see were just so drastically different at the beginning of the pandemic that we just couldn't proceed kind of as expected. So what I will be presenting you today uh, will be more limited um, to some of our um, very preliminary analyses and just um, focused on the primary mechanism that we have hypothesized, uh, just to kind of illustrate the point for um, related to um, environmental reinforcement and kind of how we're um, we're hypothesizing that to to work. So this. These data are from um, seven sections of our University 101 seminar. Um, four were the intervention um, sections and three were control. And um, the measure that we are using is the Adolescent Reinforcement Survey Schedule, the alcohol use version, which provides um, a measure of proportionate reinforcement from alcohol relative to an individual's total reinforcement from their environment. Oops. Um, and this is just some, these are demographic characteristics. Um, participants um, were largely representative of the, um, the freshmen um, who uh, come to our campus and enroll us um, as first years. And this is our single graph that I'll show you for today, but um, this is the change in proportion of alcohol uh, reinforcement from alcohol during the semester with the time points being the beginning, middle, and end of the semester. The red line that you will see um, are students from the behavioral activation um, course sections, and the blue line is the standard orientation. And you can see that we have, um, there were no significant differences at baseline at the beginning of the semester, but we had a really nice um, drop um, and a retention of that drop in the proportionate reinforcement from alcohol at the middle of the semester and at the that was retained at the end of the semester. So this really indicated to us that in, um, individuals in the intervention um, condition um, were um, decreasing in the proportion of their um, reinforcement that they were um, obtaining from, um, from alcohol use. And um, this was with a, a moderately sized effect. Um, so this kind of illustrates the, the main premise of sort of what we're expecting to happen during the intervention. And um, hopefully this will also bear out in their behavior, which um, we will be able to examine with the full trial. As I mentioned, this work is ongoing. Um, we have about 20, 20 core sections remaining, so we've got quite a bit to do still. Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully we will have some results in a few years. <laughs> So now I'll tell you and kind of shift um, shift gears to, to the second area of my work um, that I have focused on and that I mentioned is much more basic and kind of foundational. Um, and viewing um, um, hyperpalatable foods as really a strong, re, um, um, strong reinforcer and, and understanding some of their characteristics that may yield these properties. When I worked in the obesity treatment field, one thing that occurred to me that I noticed was, was quite interesting was that um, there was no scientific definition of what 
um, palatable foods, highly palatable foods, you know, use your, you know, choose your term, but there was no like standard definition for like, what are these foods? What about them yields such, you know, strong reinforcing properties that, um, you know, they're really kind of considered the source or the, of the target problem for things like, um, uh, you know, for clinically significant problems such as obesity, binge eating disorder, that type of thing. So there's just nothing. Um, what people were using were descriptive definitions um, that were specific to individual studies. So like sweets, fats, fast foods. Um, so I really saw this as kind of a, a, a really substantial limitation in that across studies, we couldn't really say if we were comparing the same things. Um, and we also just couldn't really identify like what specifically about these foods made them have these effects on our, on our behavior. Um, and, and so it seemed a little bit to me like um, if we were in the alcohol field studying um, alcohol, you know, um, alcohol consumption and we gave individuals like a beer or a mixed drink. And across those two, we couldn't actually identify like what about the drinks would cause people to become intoxicated or to seek them out, you know, uh, you know seek out um, drinks for their, you know, like particularly um, rewarding effects. Um, so I really saw this as, as like a, um, an issue that, that I thought we needed to kind of have, have some consistent way to talk about this. However, in the, um, in the media and the investigative journalism area, um, it has been made remarkably clear that food companies do have really explicit formulas for how um, they create these types of foods and how they market them. Um, and, and a lot of the evidence has, has pointed to the combination of palatability inducing nutrients. Um, and, and like I said, this has largely been, been revealed through, um, through investigative journalism. However, those definitions are pretty much uh, known to the scientific field. Um, I will first kind of describe for you the theoretical premise of hyperpalatable foods. I'll compare them with kind of naturally occurring um, foods, and then I will describe kind of my work in that area. Um, as I mentioned, hyperpalatable foods contain typically combinations of palatability inducing nutrients, uh, specifically sugar, fat, um, uh, sodium, and or carbohydrates that occur at um, at levels that um, have a synergistic effect um, and actually can create an artificially enhanced eating experience um, and also slow the engagement of our basic physiological satiety mechanisms. Uh, so this means that these foods are highly rewarding to consume and may actually be difficult to stop eating like even when we're full and our body's telling us like, okay, it's enough. These are quite distinct from foods that are kind of whole and occur in nature. Foods that occur kind of in nature typically have a profile of, a, of having one single palatability related nutrient. You can see that the salmon and the fresh almonds uh, depicted here um, both have fat as a primary and, and single palatability related nutrient. Um, naturally occurring foods also typically contain um, satiety promoting nutrients fiber, protein, water, um, that slow um, our digestion and the absorption of the more um, sort of palatability or rewarding um, pieces of these uh, or nutrients in these foods into our system. So they're quite different. You may wonder, okay, so, so this kind of on the premise is interesting, like what are hyperpalatable foods? How, what are examples of them? Um, Unfortunately, there are a lot of things. Um, they may be snack foods, a lot of basic crackers produced in the US. You know, some of your, um, the foods that you would probably expect like cheeseburgers, fast food, that type of stuff. However, they can also be um, like frozen meals sold in grocery stores and even foods that are 
sold and marketed in the US as like healthy or diet. Um, so the, the, the premise of hyperpalatability can extend quite broadly because it's simply based on the combination of specific nutrients at thresholds that may induce um, this artificially enhanced eating experience. Um, so in my work, I sought out to actually use a data-driven approach to develop a quantitative definition of these foods that was based on combinations of nutrients. And so you can see here that um, um, you know, my colleagues analyzed, uh, we did a literature review, we collected all of the foods in the literature that were identified in various descriptive studies as being um, highly palatable, difficult to stop eating, sort of with whatever kind of relevant descriptors. And then we entered them into nutrition software. We pulled all of their nutrient data, and then we were able to actually graph them and look at like some of the commonalities, like what to, to see, like what were the data telling us about these, these foods that were largely created by food companies who kind of know their formulas. So we were able to kind of at least um, derive a starting point for being able to describe this. And as you can see here, the data aligned with um, three types of hyperpalatable foods, one being elevated in fat and sodium, the other, a second being elevated in fat and simple sugars, and a third um, having um, elevated carbohydrates and sodium. So using this definition, we then wanted to see um, what are their availability in the food system and is there initial evidence that this definition picks up kind of what we were anticipating or hoping that it would pick up on. Um, so first of all, we, we used um, data from the US Department of Agriculture, um, the Food and Nutrient Database for Dietary Studies, its uh, acronym is FNDDS, and um, which contains all of the foods and beverages that are um, present in the US food system. And so we applied our definition to this database um, to characterize the initial prevalence in the food system. Um, and we found that um, hyperpalatable foods were actually quite extensive. They comprise the majority of the foods in the food system, um, over 60%. And interestingly, the majority, um, the most common type of hyperpalatable foods was actually those that had elevated fat and sodium. Um, and so this meant a lot of our like meal based items, snack based items, those were really the ones that were characterizing and, and capturing the majority of what was in our food system, not really the things that I think often, at least descriptively in the literature have often been the focus, which is like dessert type stuff, things that are high in fat and sugar. But this kind of indicated to me that like, no, actually the problem is like in our meals. We also use these data to see if we have some evidence for uh, the validity of this definition. Um, we found that um, there was pretty strong evidence of convergent validity with the definition being able to identify um, most food items that were labeled descriptively um, and expected to be hyperpalatable had had really strong discriminant validity. So it was um, consistently and appropriately not identifying foods that were hypothesized not to be hyperpalatable, um, either because they are sort of naturally occur, uh, whole foods occurring in nature without any modifications, so fresh fruit, vegetables, um, meats, and fish, um, as well as um, foods that had one primarily primary palatability related nutrient, um, such as heavy cream, nothing else added, or unsalted nuts, which would also, um, which we also also hypothesized would not be hyperpalatable. In this work and some additional work, I have also um, examined the degree to which um, this uh, definition of hyperpalatable foods um, is unique, is a unique contribution and captures something that is distinct from the existing constructs that have been used in the literature, um, which are um, energy density, which is typically characterized as uh, greater than uh, two calories per gram, um, and ultra processed foods, which are primarily identified um, based on the nature and extent of their processing. And so we found that typically there is like a reasonable amount of overlap, about 50% for energy density, 60 to 70 for ultra processed foods. But this also indicates that there's a good degree of distinctness between the hyperpalatable food definition and these existing constructs in the literature. Um, 
After the publication of the definition, I also thought it was important to examine some behavioral evidence to see um, if the foods um, it, it kind of operate in a way behaviorally that we would expect and, and have hypothesized. Um, so we have some very recent work from my lab that has established that and found that um, we have um, evidence that individuals exhibit a strong behavioral preference for hyperpalatable foods relative to non-hyperpalatable foods um, using this definition. Um, and this is an a large sample of healthy adults. And that also hyperpalatable foods um, are primarily the target of binge eating episodes among individuals with bulimia or nervosa, um, likely due to their reinforcing properties. Um, also consistent with our um, hypothesis about hi the hyperpalatable foods, um, we found that um, the selection and consumption of um, hyperpalatable foods in laboratory-based um, ad libitum meals um, is associated with greater energy intake within that meal and also was um, um, predictive of longitudinal weight and percent body fat gain, again, among healthy adults. Um, and uh, in a collab with some of my collaborator collaborators, we've also found that um, hyperpalatable foods actually serve as a mediator um, of, of ultra-processed diets and um, diets with high fat and carbs. And this is under review, but, um, but generally the evidence is it was starting to support the premise that like, okay, I think we're onto something here. Um, this, is, this is sort of operating sort of as we hypothesize. Um, and the next direction has been really looking at, okay, so we have these foods in our food system. Um, being able to understand like how have they changed over time? Um, what, and, and where are they coming from and why are they present? Um, and so the, our, our, some of our work has also focused on characterizing the change in hyperpalatable food availability um, in recent decades. And so um, I have a fantastic student um, and um, she and others in my lab took on this, this um, large scale investigation using multiple databases from the USDA and um, found that First of all, there was a 20% increase in the availability of hyperpalatable foods from 1988 to 2018. Um, and this was really <laughs> pretty substantial. As you can see now, hyperpalatable foods represent almost 70% of the foods in our food system. And the evidence really pointed to um, reformulation um, as opposed to just increasing in the variety of foods available. And I thought this was really important because what we were able to, to do was actually look at the same food from 88 to 2018. And, uh, and we found that um, compared to 1988, um, foods in 2001 were over two times more likely to be hyper palatable compared to the same food item in, 98, in 88. And that the same foods in 2018 were four, over four times more likely to be hyper palatable compared to the same food items in 88. So again, this really indicated that like the, the companies have been changing the food, like the composition of the foods over time um, with making them more likely to be hyper palatable. So our conclusions from this are that, okay, there are really substantial increases in hyperpalatable foods in the food system in the past 30 years. Um, and we have pretty strong evidence to indicate that um, the foods have been reformulated to be hyperpalatable. Um, and this led me to my next question of, how do we get here? Like, what happened? Um, how do we end up with this food system that's, that's like pretty terrible and like really difficult to, to sustain any sort of health with? Um, and so I, sh I shifted to thinking about the food system more. And we've had some major changes in food supply and technology. Um, in the 60s and 70s, we had a lot of small regional farms, regional producers of food, and they really made select or specific products um, and did not have a lot of sort of coverage of the market and really focused on individual pieces of the market. Um, we now have food companies um, that provide something for our every single need. This is actually an infographic from um, Kraft Heinz, who is a leading food company um, in the US currently. And you can see here that they actually 
just conceptualize their food, uh, their, their service in the food system as providing something for every single need, every single food and cooking interest that we might have, um, and every single activity that we might engage in. So this is a really dramatic shift. We've also had a shift from having regional food companies to, to being much more um, present nationally and influential, influential nationally and globally. Oops. And um, we've also had some changes in food industry practices where originally they were not, uh, they were just sort of targeting markets generally. And we've now had shifts to um, advertisement to like an extreme degree and really specific marketing to kids and then, you know, stuff like that. Um, so some um, very astute researchers have um, pointed out some time ago that um, there were some similarities between how the tobacco companies um, have operated with their uh, product development um, and marketing strategies um, and, and basically the big food um, companies of our time. So this made me wonder, is it possible that the same players are, are involved? Um, so a wonderful resource that exists is the University of California, San Francisco Industry Documents Library. They contain, uh, it contains documents on a variety of fields, um, um, industries in the US that can impact um, population health. And um, so some, a, a wonderful researcher out of uh, UCSF, um, Dr. Laura Schmidt um, and, and her lab provided some initial um, indication and um, a sort of a, a warning flag basically that, that food companies um, may be sort of intertwined in concerning ways. I will share her research with you momentarily. But just on the premise of it, so we have Kraft, um, a major food, company in our food system, as well as Nabisco, a large producer of crackers and cookies. Um, they've created all sorts of products that over the years we've really enjoyed, um, even the Kool-Aid man. So through this industry documents library, it has become, there are documents that indicate that um, actually leading tobacco companies have been owners of these food companies for some time, um, Philip Morris and R.J. Reynolds. Um, so my interest initially um, was, okay, that's not good. What has been the actual extent of their involvement in the foods uh, in the food system? Um, from a review of the industry documents archive and primary source documents um, of these companies, I found that um, since the early 1980s um, and through our current um, uh, 2022, Philip Morris has been a leader um, and owner of major food companies. Um, and RJ Reynolds was involved from the 1970s um, largely to the early 2000s. Philip Morris owned Kraft General Foods and uh, just dominated the US in food sales um, since around 1985 and to present day. Um, these foods, uh, sorry, food sales comprised over 50% of, of Philip Morris's revenue starting from um, um, eight, 1989. So this was like major um, timing of profit losses due to tobacco litigation. And so this really served to buoy their sales um, and their profits during a period um, that was um, um, really experiencing down, a downturn in their sales from tobacco in the national market. RJ Reynolds, as I mentioned, um, owned Nabisco and had the largest market shares uh, two to three times compared to any of its um, competitors. Um, and it comprised about 25 to 30% of its revenue um, from about the 80s to the early 2000s. Um, so this indicated to me that, that they have had some major involvement um, in our leading food companies and likely in their product development. Uh, so you may wonder, okay, well, that's not good, right? But like how concerned exactly should we be about this? 
Um, this is this is from this is a screenshot of one of the actual documents from the uh, from the industry library. You can see the document idea below and find it for yourself. This is from uh, from the Philip Morris um, documentation of a meeting that was held um, in the eighties with. Um, with shareholders. And they were really discussing like, okay, we need to think about here, like what's our goal from here? How are we gonna um, go as a, uh, what are we gonna do as a company? Are we gonna focus exclusively on tobacco products? Or are we looking for new types of products that appeal to smokers and non-smokers alike and which satisfy physiological and psychological needs similar to those satisfied by the cigarette? A few more documents. Um, this is an example from RJ Reynolds, uh, soft drinks, and they described their ultimate goal in creating soft drinks of leaving people wanting more. And from Philip Morris, they identified that snacking was essentially becoming our fourth meal and their plans to really capitalize on that in the early 2000s. You might question what is the um, what, what what research evidence do we have that this is problematic for public health at this time? Like, what do we know? What don't we know? Mostly, we don't know. What we do have evidence of is two studies um, um, that leverage the the industry documents library and um, revealed that the tobacco industry involvement um, in the children's sugary drink market. Um, and used really specific strategies to target marketing, going around the parents and directly to the kids um, to, to sell their products and also using a lot of coloring and flavoring that was really appealing to kids. Similarly, uh, another, the, they published another study as well, um, documenting the really explicit and um, planned um, transfer of marketing strategies from the tobacco um, from what the companies learned in the tobacco um, marketing to racial and ethnic uh, minorities in the food industry. And so there, this was, even though they said that they wouldn't do it, et cetera, et cetera, they, they really directly applied their marketing strategies um, to targeting um, and, and tailored marketing of food products. My question, my biggest question is, um, so to what extent are these companies responsible for the proliferation of hyper foods in our food system? We know that um, from the data that I shared with you earlier that there has been a remarkable change, 20 percentage point increase um, in the availability of hyper foods in the past 30 years. Um, the largest part of that change was from the from 88 to around the early 2000s, which was sort of prime time for tobacco industry, um, you know, in terms of leading the food system. And, but there is no work beyond these two, the two studies that I shared with you um, to, to indicate what their involvement has meant for our food system and what's in our food system. My work therefore is um, ongoing, but we are investigating this exact question. Today, I'll share some very preliminary findings with you all today, and then I'll wrap up. Um, we again use data from the department, um, the US Department of Agriculture, and um, we identified foods as being owned by a tobacco company versus not. And we have some initial evidence that at least cross-sectionally, um, both in 88 and in 98, um, tobacco ownership was significantly associated with the likelihood that a food was um, classified as hyperpalatable. We do have more longitudinal work going on um, that is needed to fully characterize um, their potential involvement, um, but this is kind of our, our initial findings. Um, so the implications here are that we exist, we live in a food environment in which the majority of foods are designed to take advantage of our neurobiology to like facilitate our consumption and make them difficult to stop eating. We really need policy regulation on this and it is really not inside at all. Um, policy regulation has largely been hampered by the fact that we didn't have a definition. We can't even, you know, we can't say like get rid of all fast foods or get rid of all desserts in the food system. Um, so this um, definition 
can be sort of a building block to, to develop specific evidence um, that is needed for policy regulation. And this would mean a change in, uh, simply a change in the level of ingredients to be below a threshold that would induce hyperpalatability. So for example, if a food item had um, fat and sugar in it, um, a, a legislative requirement could be that they cannot contain, they have to be under the 20% threshold for both fat and sugar um, because that may induce hyperpalatability. So this, a benefit of this is that it would retain all the foods in the food system, just require food companies to drop the levels of nutrients um, to be below these thresholds. Um, <laughs> overall, I think, I think you can see that, that where I, have ended up going with, with my work was, is, is in a way full circle. Um, I didn't quite see that coming, <laughs> but, but here we are. Um, and so, so in, in some ways I, I, I'm really excited about this work. I think that there's so much that our field needs to do. And um, we have a lot of exciting directions that are sort of based on this work. And um, that include things like, you know, using a, an a, exposure risk perspective from the substance use area, um, you know, examining the implications for hyperpalatable food exposure, um, we really need to go to infancy to do that because infants are exposed to these foods. And so there's, there's wide potential that um, the potential dysregulation um, of our, you know, sort of food reinforcement mechanism starts in infancy in our food environment. Um, we also, of course, need more work to, to understand like what exactly are have been the effects and the consequences of the tobacco industry involvement in our food system. Um, and I think that this really needs to become much more public knowledge. Um, this is virtually unknown. Uh, the role of the tobacco industry in the food system is virtually unknown to scientific researchers. And so getting this out to, to science, but also the public, I think is really gonna be critical to moving any type of legislation. Um, similar to what we saw with the, um, with the original tobacco epidemic where there was um, much more, once public support was, was really strong behind legislation of tobacco, um, that, was, that was a key point in being able to move the needle in, in actually enacting legislation um, to protect public health. Um, so I think um, I will wrap up here and leave us, uh, it should be about 10 minutes for questions. I wanna thank um, the students and research staff in my lab. Um, and those students uh, noted are the ones that have uh, directly contributed some, some of the work that I described today. Uh, our uh, funding and of course my collaborators at KU and um, all over. So thank you so much and I'm happy to take questions. All right. Thank you very much, Tara. That's a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm confident that you're really onto something with the hyperpalatable food. Uh, the data, you know, gives you feedback and you've got wonderful data. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we have some questions for you for palatable foods. Or more broadly, what's, what are some ways that we can de-incentivize consumption? Oof. <laughs> um, that's tricky, right? I think the issue that we have with hyperpalatable foods is that they are designed to be artificially reinforcing. Um, and it's hard for them to compete with naturally occurring foods. Um, so I think what really needs to happen is in our food environment to decrease their prevalence. Because even when we see, it, for example, you know, efforts to increase access, um, you know, in areas that have low access to like healthy foods, even when we see, you know, in some areas where we increase access to fruits and vegetables, people oftentimes still go for the hyper foods. And it's, it's, I mean, they're designed that way. Like the, the companies want this to happen, um, but it becomes very difficult to then kind of ask the individual to navigate that. And, and so I think really we need um, people to just have less access and have it be less kind of widely available to actually see any really like meaningful change. Um, right now as a society, we largely put all of the effort or the, the responsibility on the individual 
to like, oh, don't eat those foods. Like, you know, you can lose weight if you just like don't eat those foods or you eat healthy, you know, but, but, but that's not really recognizing the system that we're in. And so I think really to be able to address people's consumption of these foods, um, a lot of it needs to be like markedly reduced in the food system. I mean, we have restrictions, you know, alcohol is a legal substance, but we have restrictions on who can access it and under what conditions. And there's a reason for that because we have um, strong evidence that under certain circumstances, there are people who are particularly vulnerable in our society um, who will develop some strong consequences from, from alcohol if it's just like very freely available or if it's introduced at a very early age. Um, and so we just, we, we don't have any of that with these foods. So I think it really needs to come from um, the policy level and public support behind policy regulation to actually really be able to make meaningful change. There's another question here in the alcohol field, we consider the difficulty of disentangling the caloric value of a drink from other rewarding reinforcing properties related directly to addiction. How do you think about this with regard to the fruit, food? Um, I think, so the, there are multiple ways in which a food might have reinforcing <clears throat> properties. My focus on the, the hyper palatability piece per se um, is I think a key component of this that has been lacking. The, it is true that, that we, are neurobiologically predisposed to seek out foods that have higher caloric value because, um, you know, long ago, like that, that promotes our survival. So we needed to do that. Um, I think that that is more captured in the construct of energy density. Um, energy density is a measure of caloric, you know, density per gram of the food. And I think that we have, uh, so I think about that as, as they're related. They're both, I think, important for driving um, energy intake. And, um, but I think they're distinct. And so they, they, it's important to recognize both of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I I, another question. question, how do we address, how do we address cultural conceptions behind hyper palatable food? What comes to mind is that the stereotypical college student diet is comprised of instant Raymond and uh, burritos. <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think it's specific to college students, right? Like, um, I, I think the, what we're showing in our research is that like the vast majority of foods in our food system are hyper palatable. So I think it's, it, um, probably any like healthy individual that you approach on the street is probably going to be consuming a pretty large percentage of hyper palatable foods. Um, whether they're also sort of lower in like um other nutrients it maybe gets at the the piece about college students eating ramen um but they're they're everywhere so i and i i, I think it's it's to some degree in, ingrained in our culture in the sense that like everybody like that we expect things to be really reinforcing, really big, really impactful. And that's kind of like the US <laughs> approach to like a lot of things, right? Here though, it catches us because, um, and I think that the food companies are, are very well tapped into that fact and that they really lean into that. So their marketing, everything about their approaches are really focused on like, leaning into the fact that like, oh, you don't need to go to even, you know, get a burger and have it be a single, let's get a double or a triple. Like, let's do all the, you know, the, the size of an average drink, like, like soft drink, if you go to a restaurant or really anywhere out it is enormous. <laughs> so I think that, that this is all, it's all intertwined, but I, um, I think that there are things, um, you know, specific to our culture that expect big and impactful and really reinforce, you know, reinforcing in some way that are not necessarily as strong in other cultures. Um, and I think that the food companies are, are very keenly aware of this and use this to their advantage in marketing. Some additional questions. Can you talk a bit more about your experience with integrating interventions with the college course, experience with the administration, students, faculty? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so we approached from the beginning um, the course mm -hmm. integration 
when we developed the grant, we made sure, first of all, that we had like very upper admin support at the college level to be able to do this letters of support. We met with them to really make sure that like, okay, if we get this grant, like we, we're really gonna do this and, and we really wanna make sure that it works. And so they were very enthusiastic and on board to begin with. Um, we have worked very closely with the, our, our university has a university 101 kind of program um, and leadership um, that is set up to run that specific program. And so we were really um, able to work with them to um, and, and to make sure that they were on board with the chain, you know, with the what we were overlaying as part of the intervention. Um, and also to, to respect what they have developed and make sure that we are adhering to like running the course that they've set out to run for students, which is to orient them to college, make them aware of resources, engage them in various activities with various groups, um, and all sorts of those, you know, sort of like initial things that you need once you get to college. So we wanted to make sure that that we were respectful and true to keeping that um, structure and that um, intent of the program and um, making sure that we didn't remove anything that could be potentially at the expense of a student's education or their development in college um, and really retaining that. So I think that that has been kind of a good um, sort of way to build that relationship. So they make changes to the curriculum. We make sure to incorporate those and vice versa. Um, the, the, we actually just um, had a paper accepted that actually gets us a question about like the student reactions um, because we did um, in our first year do some qualitative work in addition to trying to refine um, some measures and the um, the monitoring piece of the intervention, and so we um, it, it, the students responded pretty nicely to the the behavioral activation piece, which is largely focused on um, having students um, identify their goals and values in life and in college, and to engage in reinforcing activities that directly align with those goals and values. Um, I think it's been particularly um, highly accepted because we never, we don't bring up alcohol directly. We never address drinking directly unless a student identifies it as something specific that they want to change. So we are, so we're just helping them align their behavior with their activities in a way that is reinforcing. Um, and so because of that, I think students have really enjoyed it. They've also just really appreciated the fact that like we had them thinking about kind of broader picture and that um, when um, we were trying to sort of help them identify ways that they could align their behavior, that we that that the focus is on things that are are rewarding and important towards their goals. Um, and so I think that they've overall the students have responded really um, really well, and it's been really highly um, sort of accepted. Well, Tara, one last question. We're largely out of time, but. Um... There's a question here. Do you know anything about the longer term uh, lasting effects chain to a healthier diet? There may be carryover from the uh, less healthy diet. Woof. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. so <laughs> the question I think kind of has two pieces. One is what are the effects, or I, I view those as two components. One is like, what are the potential effects of consumption and exposure to hyper foods on um, the reinforcement system and on brain reward neurocircuitry? And then what are the effects on, um, you know, like our, our broader physiology and, and health related outcomes? And so um, we largely don't know. Um, the One of the, the papers that I have in press right now um, in current addictive reports uh, um, reviews the existing literature on that specifically, like what is the evidence that these um, sort of have effects um, on our uh, reinforcement system and on our longer term um, health outcomes. And so I think it's largely an open question, but there is evidence to start to indicate that, first of all, there are longer term consequences neurobiologically from these uh, foods consumed over time. Um, and in some cases, in a similar way to other drugs of abuse in terms of like really sort of exhausting the dopamine reward system and, and, and um, also, um, um, leading to kind of changes in incentive salience and, and leaving people with really high or you know excessive motivation to consume these types of foods. Um, and, and those are those are quite similar to what we see with with um, the changes that occur with other substance use. So it's an area that's open, but it's really important and concerning. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Tara, for spending time with us this afternoon. It, it was really a terrific lecture. And thanks to the audience for, for being with us. And uh, we'll pick up the fun again in, in September. Hope everybody has a great summer and see you soon. So thanks again, Tara. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.